to day three of uh, the South and West Pacific Regional um, Centres meeting for CB2030. Today, um, oh, just for a heads up for everybody, this meeting will be recorded uh, and the videos will be made available on the centre website at the end of this meeting. So today, last day, um, we're going to start the morning session with um, some uh, catch ups about some other data centres uh, for the CB2030 project. Um, then we'll have a short break and then uh, the last thing on agenda is a, a follow up open discussion which I really encourage anyone um, to uh, particip particip participate on. If you have any questions that you didn't get time to answer in the previous two days, there's a good opportunity to get them asked and answered. Um, and I've got some other some discussion topics that I've uh, organised that we can talk about. So starting off right away, uh, is Dr Vicky Ferrini, who's um, a head of the Atlantic and Indian Ocean Data Centre. Uh, Vicky, if you're ready, you can start sharing your screen uh, and we'll start with your presentation. Um, so hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me. As Kevin said, I lead the um, CBED 2030 Center for the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, some tools that we have at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University that we um, have been developing over the past several decades, um, which are part of what we're using in our efforts to um, build the Seabed 2030 compilation for the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, and also to contribute data uh, for other regional centers to integrate into the Seabed 2030 uh, products. Um, the tools that I'm gonna show you are all freely available as is the data that they um, make accessible to you. So a little bit of background about what GMRT is. GMRT stands for the Global Multi-Resolution Topography Synthesis. It is in fact a multi-resolutional data synthesis. It's available in a variety of different formats, images and grids. Um, it's also a cloud-based infrastructure for delivering elevation data as grids, images, profiles, and points at user-defined locations um, that has extensive metadata and also provides access to source data, uh, specifically swath files and also individual grids that have been compiled. GMRT is also a tiling scheme for efficiently storing and delivering this multi-resolutional data. It's maintained simultaneously in three different projections. Um, and it's also a scalable methodology for QA and QC of multi-beam sonar data that's exceptionally well suited in my experience for integrating and working with multi-beam data acquired during transits. Um, GMRT is also a contributor to the Jebco grid. Um, before CBED 2030 uh, was conceived of and created, CBED, uh, GMRT was contributing its content to Jebco um, since 2014. And I just wanted to acknowledge that this effort and this uh, really intellectual effort and body of knowledge was initiated in 2004 by my colleagues at Lamont, William Ryan, Suzanne Carbot, Bill Haxby, and Suzanne O'Hara. And they've built this upon the work that they did prior to that, starting in the 90s, that was called the Ridge Multibeam Synthesis. So the approach that we're using for GMRT is really to support a broad user base by offering the best resolution data that's seamlessly integrated with lower resolution data. And we're managing this, as I said, as tiled multi-resolutional um, raster data in an architecture that we've designed ourselves. Our goal is to support, to support specialist and non-specialist users alike. So custom grids and images are easily created um, by user request. Multiple formats are supported, and there are multiple different data access options through interfaces and web services. Um, and of course, for specialist users, you can get all the way down to the source swath data files if that's of interest. Um, uh, we've got these three projections that we maintain in parallel, so we cover the whole globe with this um, tiled architecture. And most of our curatorial effort is focused on publicly available swath data. We treat cruises from port to port, really trying to fill in as much content as possible. 
Um, as I mentioned, the tools are very well suited for sparse transit data where you don't have overlap between adjacent survey lines, just single lines crossing large uh, portions of the ocean. Uh, it of course also works for survey data, um, but there's other tools that do very good jobs with survey data as well. And we have a really extensive metadata catalog that preserves cruise information, data set information, the make and model of the sonars, file level metadata, coverage statistics, and that's what really drives the links to the source files for people who need that. We also have a mask that shows the mapped portions of the ocean that's built automatically as data are integrated. So the way that GMRT is brought together is by bringing four different elevation sources that are maintained in parallel and updated at different schedules. We do use the JEBCO grid for the underlying really uh, sparsely mapped or unmapped areas of the ocean. Um, we are going to update soon to the JEBCO 2021 grid, but at present we use the JEBCO 2014 grid. So it's roughly one kilometer resolution. We have land topography data that's integrated in there at a variety of resolutions. But again, most of our work focuses on bringing swath data in, um, assessing it, cleaning it, making sure it's going to blend well, and also integrating that with little contributed grids from all over the place um, that are generally um, kind of postage stamps, little areas that are very well surveyed but don't cover large, large areas. Access is provided through all the content being available on the Amazon cloud. Um, the map tool, the URL for that is here. It uses the web services to provide access and a user interface so people can extract data of interest in a variety of formats. I won't spend too much time on that. A little bit about the web services. We have a variety of them out there and what this does is it enables others to use our base map and our um, access our raster content, the gridded elevation values as well. There's a few examples of different uses of our web services here. Uh, the most recent that I've added to my list is the Sail Drone um, Mission Planner is actually using GMRT to help plan some of its surveys because of the high resolution that's made available through our web services. GeoMap App is a Java-based application, freely available. It provides access to hundreds, if not thousands of other data sets from all over the world, both marine and terrestrial. GMRT is the default base map in this application, and it's available for people to make custom grids and images as well using GMRT. You can link your way in and download the source swath files. Again, if that's of interest, you can easily identify data gaps, plan new surveys, uh, find out the different sources, the countries and the cruises, all that kind of information, and look at all of this in the context of these other data. This is an application that pulls content from a server online. So um, if people want to use it at sea, we have an at sea mode where we actually bundle all the content and send it to sea. So these tools have really been developed with an eye toward um, serving the needs of the US community because we're funded primarily by the NSF, the US National Science Foundation, but they're certainly broadly available to everyone um, and we see that they're used around the world. So a little bit more about the multi-beam uh, data curation, which um, really I think is how we're getting uh, sort of the building blocks that we're feeding into Seabed 2030 and making available to the world. Uh, with our current release, we have 9.9% of the ocean covered at roughly 100 meter resolution. This is over 35 million square kilometers, uh, almost 300,000 swath files, more than 30 billion data points, um, the swath files are on the order of seven terabytes, but of course the synthesis is a much smaller volume than that. We've integrated data from over 1200 cruises dating back to 1980. Um, data that's been integrated so far goes up to 2020 and we're actively working on data um, from the past several years. You can see in the plot on the top right, the orange is the data that we're actively working on. So most of it is recent, but some of it goes back. We have data from 42 contributing vessels and 29 operating institutions. Again, this is mostly US National Science Foundation sort of academic research fleet focused, but it's not limited exclusively to that. And we're really trying to make our tools available to help anyone um, bring data together and actually use GMRT as a quality 
assurance sort of base map to make sure that as we process data, we do the best job possible and use that underlying data set for context. So as we do our data processing and our data logging, I won't read all of this to you, but we, we track a lot of statistics, which I mentioned. We put that publicly on our website to make it uh, available to people. One of the useful things here is we actually compute um, an extinction plot. So the plot that's in the middle of the page toward the left side. Um, it is basically the swath width as a function of depth. And so we put that out there so that people can have a good understanding of the actual swath performance of different systems. And when scientists go to use these systems, in this case on the RV Atlantis, with its older system, they'd know what the swath width would be like at different water depths, and then they could plan their surveys appropriately. Uh, we're linking to all sorts of different data here and making um, the percent or the, the total area mapped and the polygons that we've computed from the swath files available as well. So the workflow that we use is also based on open source uh, tools. We really rely heavily on MB system. We have Java code that has been written and evolved over the years. We can take raw multi-beam files or processed multi-beam files, perhaps those having been processed with Chimera or um, Keras. We can bring those in, grid it with our gridding engine, and then compare the data with the underlying GMRT to make sure that it meets the quality standards. And we frequently find sound velocity problems. We occasionally find role biases that need to be correct corrected. Um, and really just often, even if we're bringing in process data, sometimes it needs additional work. And so this is a really nice way to find the problems and address them um, so we can integrate the data into the highest quality product as possible. Of course, this is a lot of effort to do. Um, we're not a big team. Here's some examples of the kinds of problems that we we discover and fix. Again, sound velocity is extremely common as a problem to have to fix and often slips by um, in other processing algorithm or tools. And again, this is often a problem in transit data where we want people to be collecting data because they're underway in an unmapped place and they may not be paying total attention to the system, but it's still important to collect that data and we can fix these problems in post-processing. So given the amount of effort that it takes, and if you look at the plot on the top right here, you can see that the dark line is the data that we've processed and integrated versus the orange, which is all of the data from the US academic fleet that's publicly available in the NOAA archive. And we're keeping pace relatively well, but not completely. If we look at the total content available at the DCDB, you'll see we've, we certainly aren't keeping up as much. And when we start to think more broadly about CBED 2030, as people are making more and more raw data available, how can we accelerate this process and keep pace with the data that's becoming available? So here's another example. I'm sure you've seen this the last couple of days, the unmapped ocean from the Jebco perspective. There's huge gaps of data. We want to get this data processed and integrated as quickly as possible. So in my opinion, the best way that we can do this is to leverage the power of the community to accelerate processing and integration of ocean mapping data. A lot of us are doing this work in different corners of the world, and if we work together and share our workflows and our approaches, we can ensure that data quality are um, meet a certain standard and can be integrated more readily and benefit everyone. So the vision that we're working toward is community coordinated data processing and integration. And so we're working on this within the US community, leveraging efforts that are underway um, in a fleet wide perspective and really trying to take our tools and make them accessible to more people so we can accelerate the pace of processing data. We can also ensure that the data quality is as good as possible or has had a little bit more assessment and we can improve the quality of the data that's going to the NOAA archive, which in turn goes is the IHO DCDB, so the International Archive. To date, we have implemented this um, on the Ocean Exploration Trust's vessel Nautilus. Um, it's now part of their standard workflow. We had a presentation about this at the American Geophysical Union meeting in the fall. Um, we're working to get this deployed on other vessels. Again, this would make use of the GeoMap app at sea disk. Um, we're also deploying it shoreside with different collaborators across the US. 
including students at um, the College of Charleston, at the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics, and also the JEBCO training program up at UNH. Uh, this year, students actually worked with us to test out the workflow and try to learn about how it works and how MB system works. And so I think there's the potential here to really scale out this approach um, so that we can work together to make sure that data meets a particular fit for purpose standard and we can really accelerate the pace of data um, into the systems and into the products that we all are excited to create. So what we're working on now is really trying to enhance and optimize the workflow to make it a bit simpler, maybe build a user interface and some better documentation. Uh, we've developed a prototype dashboard for coordinating so that we can ensure that not you know multiple people aren't processing the same data files and we've started to explore the use of an ArcGIS based tool for QA QC so beyond GeoMap app what other tools can be used we're also really excited to be building collaborations um, you know GMRT is being used as part of the national bathymetry data set that NOAA is putting together for deep water um, we have a collaboration with our seabed to scale up and um, extend some of the functionality and of course, uh, we're partners with Seabed 2030, contributing data and really trying to make this approach usable and uh, extendable to a broader community. So I know there's a lot of words here. I <laughs> will try not to bore you by reading all of them, but just to emphasize that these are freely available tools. We're really working to make them more available and accessible to the, com to the broader community. And I think that this distributed approach and coordinated processing can really accelerate the rate of data integration and alleviate bottlenecks um, and really ensure that processed data files that get made available are truly fit for purpose and that we catch these pesky little problems before it becomes available and then we don't have to put multiple versions in archives, et cetera, and really just improve the quality of data that's made available to everyone and minimize redundant effort so that we can really get data sets across the finish line um, by the people who are processing them the first time. Um, again, ongoing work is to make this more robust and distributable, and we're really excited to um, experiment and work with people to see how we can get it deployed elsewhere. And with that, I will end and thank you for your time. If you have questions or are interested in trying this out, feel free to email me. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I'd like to start off by apologising to everybody about the technical issues we had. I sent people away um, and then we resolved the issues a lot faster than we thought. So you might have missed the first part of Vicky's presentation. Um, just to remind you that, that this is recorded. So if you are interested, um, you can go jump on the recording once we publish it and see Vicky's presentation in full if you did miss it. I do have a, a couple of questions for Vicky though. Um, on the graph there where you showed um, the, the on, on the um, x-axis was years and then you had number of surveys and you showed some that are being um, some surveys that were rejected why are surveys rejected yeah sure i'll actually turn my camera on to you <laughs> um so they may be small surveys that don't add any coverage uh they may be uh there sometimes are cruises where the data files are lacking um, attitude data, for example, or the quality just we can't deal with it. The format's a very old MB system format that we can no longer read or can't make the adjustments that are necessary, that kind of thing. Um, we really strive to get as much coverage in as possible and optimize the quality. Occasionally we'll exclude data files if we can't get them to a reasonable point, but um, yeah, they're generally areas that have already been surveyed. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. And, and the second question is um, the whole system works on the basis that you've got the raw data files to start with. Can you deal with a purely gridded product that's given to you or do you have to have the dot all, you know, the raw multi beam files? So the system can use swath files, not just raw. It could be processed. Um, so any MB system compatible format can be read into the multi beam component and gridded, um, but we absolutely can take gridded files um, and those can be at any resolution. There's grids in there that I've created at half meter resolution in the deep sea and those get nested right inside. Um, and we have logic 
So unlike the BIS approach that Esri uses, where you're pretty much just layering the different data, the different raster sets, we have logic in there that will allow us to um, do some a little bit more manipulation when the data gets interwoven. So we could say have the multi-beam data shine through the gridded data set at particular water depths, or we could clip the gridded data set at different water depths, or we can actually put a vertical datum shift because sometimes submersible data is uh, vertically offset from multi-beam ship-based data and rather than shifting the entire <laughs> synthesis down to the to the submersible data, we'll shift the submersible data sometimes to make it blend more easily. So there's a bunch of features in there that allow us to do that. And, it, and it's all driven by metadata, right? So metadata is the key to everything that you do. Absolutely. And the other thing, I didn't get too deep into it, but with the each cruise that's tiled and gridded, we blend that into the multi-beam compilation, but we also maintain that tiled gridded raster set on a per cruise basis. So that basically gives us the potential for to dial in the capability for a user to say, I only want the blended data from particular sonar systems or particular years or particular ships. And we could actually blend that on the fly. And so this is some of the stuff that we're exploring with our seabed, how we can actually dial more customizability into what users extract. Excellent. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you can read that, Vicky, from Yukari. Uh, she would like to know about how you do E and O activity during COVID-19. <laughs> Just like this. <laughs> Virtually. Uh, we've, uh, there have been a lot of virtual opportunities. We, it's an interesting challenge trying to, for example, get the software installed and running for the Jebco students this year up at UNH because they were all working remotely with virtual machines and everyone had a different configuration. So it was a really good learning experience, which I think will help us make a better distributable product and a better uh, cookbook to help guide people through it. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything right now maintains uh, is still happening virtually and I think we're having pretty good success but certainly looking forward to uh, having <laughs> a little bit more in-person time with people. Do you think that in, in the future the world may never be quite the same again so that these techniques that we're learning now will actually be business as normal in the future? I mean honestly I think that what we're learning now to do because we're being forced to will help us do business better in the future. It's much more efficient for us to meet virtually than to, I mean, it's wonderful to go meet in person, don't get me wrong, but we can get a lot of done with virtual engagement. And actually this year with the students from the College of Charleston that are working with us, it's the first year that we've had them work completely remotely and um, it's working remarkably well. And part of it too is just like with this meeting, when we have these virtual interactions, we can record it. And so if we're teaching the students how to do something, we can record it and then redistribute it to them and they can watch it again and again until they learn it, so. Excellent. Uh, so Ikari saying that they, uh, the Jamstick are doing the same sort of thing as well. And I think that's just the way of the future. Yes. Uh, there's a question from Haya. Possibly. With the possibility that people who download raw data and process it for their own purposes, can they send you the process files? Yes. That's a good question. So, so what, what we're doing with OET, what we had done prior to 2020 with OET is they sent us GSFs, we gridded them, we reviewed them. If we saw problems, we corresponded with them and they fixed the problems. Then we integrated the data into GMRT and we passed the GSFs to NCEI. So those are at the, at the IHO DCDB now. What we did subsequently is we installed the tiling code on the ship. So while they're at sea, they're creating GSFs, they're tiling them and reviewing them in the context of GMRT. And then when they get back to shore, they send me the tiles and the GSFs. I can look at the tiles very quickly and confirm that they look fine. And then we can move everything along much more rapidly. I should also clarify that 
in the case where other people are doing the data processing, for example, if my group in CBED 2030 is processing data, which we do, and we push it through GMRT, or in the case where OET processes data, or UNH or NOAA, we carry attribution indicating that they did the data processing because attribution and, and acknowledging everyone's effort is so critical, I think, to building trust for data sharing. And we don't want to make people think that we're pretending that we're doing the work. We're just allowing the tool that we've built to be part of this ecosystem to help ensure that the data quality is better. Awesome. Yeah, and actually a, a contribution and acknowledgement is actually a, a key point to any of these collaborative um, uh, campaigns and that's that's a something uh that's a very good point um so thank you vicky i don't think there's any other questions there's no hands raised so thank you very much vicky i hope you hang around for the discussion later on this afternoon or well, tonight your time um, i will try to stick around thank you thank you so um moving next on to the agenda um we have a talk from paul johnson who um from the north pacific regional data center paul is on the summer vacation i believe so he's uh, given us a pre-recorded um, presentation. So I think uh, we will start Paul's talk now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paul Johnson and I am part of the Arctic and North Pacific Ocean Regional Center. Our center is a collaboration between Stockholm University and the University of New Hampshire. For this talk, I'll just be giving an update on the activities that have been occurring in the North Pacific and my collaborators in this are Tomer Ketter and Larry Mayer. So first I'd like to talk about some of the mapping data that's been identified in the North Pacific and this is work that's been predominantly done by Tomer Ketter. Uh, he has identified 131 cruise data sets uh, with raw multi-beam data that was collected by the UNOS fleet. Uh, 732 bag files from NOAA and NOS were downloaded and incorporated into the JEPCO 2021 grid, 29 cruise data sets from Pangea and 13 cruise data sets from Ocean Network Canada were identified. Uh, the CHS track sounding data, also known as NONA, was downloaded as grids and a trickle of new cruises have also been uploaded to NCI and identified and incorporated. I would also like to mention uh, contributed data to our center. So this is data that is helping with the North Pacific mapping efforts. And this includes NGA data. So this is six second ASCII data that was contributed via the GDAC and we are currently processing it for hopeful inclusion in 2022. And I'll mention a little bit more about this in a bit. There's five deeps data. So five different cruises um, as grids that were brought in via Larry Mayer and NCI, and they were incorporated into the 2021 submission. Uh, Sanwell and Lonsdale uh, sent MB System ROM multi-beam files, and these came from the GDAC indirectly, and they were incorporated into the 2021 submission. Uh, grids of China scuffing data, and these came via the South and West Pacific RDAC and are set for inclusion in 2022. Uh, Ocean Exploration Trust data. So this is bathymetry data collected by the multi-beam on the EV Nautilus. Uh, we've been receiving this directly. We are planning on getting their 2020 data anytime now. Uh, GMRT, so we incorporated the most recent version of the grids and this was sent to us directly and it, and it is in the 2021 submission. So besides identifying, collecting, processing, and integrating uh, data sets to help with the North Pacific mapping. We've also been working on a few other different projects. And one of these is a method for data type separation. And the other is a series of different kind of projects involving our Esri GIS portal. And this includes uh, making collaborative data assessment tools, uh, tools for data management, and also um, visualizations of the JEPCO grid. So one of the projects I've been working on this spring is a data type separation method. And what this is, is a means to separate different data types that are intermixed within a single grid. So oftentimes we get grids contributed to the center and within these grids, There'll be multi-beam data, single-beam data, point data, 
possibly even contour data. And oftentimes there's no type identification layer with the grid or source identification layer. So teasing apart these different intermix data types is difficult. And we really do need to separate them as we want to be able to prioritize the different data types when we make our final data products. So this here is actually an example of some CHS Nona data. And here you can see this beautiful multi-beam data. And surrounding it is a lot of single beam point data. This data isn't actually of any lesser quality than the multi-beam data, but it is of a different data density. So it would be really nice to be able to separate those two data sets. Um, I've tried a bunch of different methods um, using tools and scripts I've written in ArcGIS Pro. Um, it's a little early to be presenting that, but actually the main reason I'm kind of presenting this right now is I'm hopeful that maybe somebody else has kind of cracked this nut before and has some ideas on better ways to proceed than I've been down. So like, I'm hopeful that my ways will eventually work, but if you've got a better way to do it, I would love to hear it. So the other projects I want to mention all actually involve the use of our Esri GIS portal. Uh, so the University of New Hampshire Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping has been serving data through a combination of either ArcGIS Server or ArcGIS Server and Portal since 2012. So we actually have a, had a fairly wrong, long run of using this technology. Uh, we use it for both internal services and external services. And we host a pretty wide variety of map services and web applications, including um, services for our extended continental shelf mapping efforts, uh, our Gulf of Maine mapping efforts, and also things such as multi-beam planning tools. So trying to find the best place to do, say, a patch test or an accuracy test. So all of these services are available through um, maps.ccom.unh.edu. So one of the types of tools that we've made using our GIS portal is a collaborative data quality assessment tool. So this is a web application that was created and hosted on our Esri GIS portal. Uh, we initially used it for doing reviews of the North Pacific grids but um, for the last few years, we've also done it for the draft releases of the JEPCO grids. And what it does is it allows us to load the JEPCO bathymetry layer into the portal, uh, create a service that has a dynamically drawn pa color palette. So as you zoom in, the colors you see associated with the bathymetry will scale with the range of depths that you see. Um, you can then go in, easily draw a polygon, um, and associate metadata with the polygon. So you can put in things like potential data issue, the tract area, the, any comments you have in the reviewer you are. And many of these fields actually have pull downs so that you don't actually have to actually enter anything. You can just pull down and choose what you want. And then at the end of the day, uh, you can export the entire database out to common formats. So either KML or shapefile. So um, you can bring it into, you know, the program of your choice to work with later on. So we've also built a data management tool, and this is actually um, was initially available only internally, but we've since made it externally available um, for people that have questions about data, especially data in the North Pacific. And we use it for managing and exploring available data sets. So some of the layers that are included in this are the current JEPCO grid and TID, as well as some historical versions of them. Um, we have links to the DCDB map services, so we can go in, we can query, um, you know, marine the marine track line survey bathymetry to look for new cruises. Um, we can look at NOS bags either as grids or as footprints. We can look at the NOS surveys. We can look at any of the track line data sets, so multi-beam and single beam. Um, we can look at the gap analysis. We can look at the DCB DB's compiled bathymetry grid and many more. So this layer all by itself has saved us an incredible amount of time and, and it's accessible by 
anyone, so either us in the center or for users uh, outside the center. The last thing I wanted to touch on is a kind of a current ongoing project is our Jebco 2021 Globe visualization. And so I'm going to just get into a little bit about the layers that are assembled to put it together and how we did it. And also kind of kind of show off a little bit just at least through recording animation what you can do. But this is a service that is available for anyone to play with. So what we did is I took the Jabco 2021 um, Global Bathymetry and Topography Grid and actually made a global elevation data set within ArcGIS Pro and loaded this onto our Esri server. We also created um, a colored bathymetry um, layer. So this is pretty much sim similar to the layer that I showed for our data reviewer application. So this is a fixed range color palette so that you have the same color for a depth no matter where you go in the world. Um, we also created an indirect mask. So this is basically blacking out any portions of the data set that are not the result of a direct measurement. Um, so you can see that is black and where the direct measurements are, you can see the bathymetry layer underneath shining through. And we also made a direct measurements layer. So this is um, the color with a kind of a rainbow color palette um, showing where the bathymetry with direct measurements is located. And for each of these different layers, we created a map service and made this map service a tile set so that it could be rapidly viewed. Um, as part of this, the bathymetry and the direct measurements layer also have a multi-directional hill sh shade applied to them so you can get a side lighting effect, but you're not constrained about worrying about shadows from different angles, especially with a globe where you can kind of spin and look at it from any angle. Having a fixed uh, side lighting didn't seem to be the best approach. So we took these layers, um, made a web scene on our, our JS portal, and then generated a web application using a template that was available through the server. And from this, we made a full-blown package. So on our server, there are two different versions of our Jebco globe. Um, the first is a self-rotating globe. So it has a play button. You can put it up, it'll spin itself around, and you can let it just play merrily on its way. The other is a more interactive globe, and this is the version I'm showing to the right. And this lets you spin, pan, tilt, reorientate the scene to whatever you want. Uh, you can turn on and off the direct measurement layer. And as you can see, this layer has a seven times vertical exaggeration. Uh, the one they were missing right now is our indirect measurement mask. And this will be added soon, having a little bit of issue with the black layer. But we've kind of set this up to be a really easy to use service. And it lets you kind of quickly get in and intuitively look at the data from around the globe. Um, and please try it out. Um, and if there's any comments um, about it, just let me know. So that is the end of my presentation. I wish I was there. Um, I hope you have a great meeting. Thank you. Yeah, that was a, that was a great talk from Paul. So um, Paul really is quite brilliant at what he does in terms of those visualizations um, about showing the data. So I, just in the chat, I've actually put the link uh, to that, that portal. Uh, and I encourage everybody to get on there and play with it, especially the uh, the Arc Globe um, application we find very useful. Um, and, and I actually encourage anyone who's listening to um, use that application and zoom into your area of interest just to see what data there is in your part of the world. Um, and, and more to the point, if you know of data sets that are in that um, Globe product, um, we would actually really like to know that, that there are data sets out there that, that are currently not in Jibco. Whether or not we can get them or not is besides the point. We would just like to know whether or not someone has actually acquired data there. Um, that's what we're really after. So um, Paul, because he presented it, we can't really ask him questions. Uh, although if you do have questions for him, 
you can either email them um, to pacific at cb.org or just put them in the chat and we can compile them and um, send them to Paul and he can answer them um, and we, we can put you guys in contact with them if you do want to ask those questions. Uh, moving on to the agenda, we're going to the um, next uh, item, which is a presentation from Toma. Uh, Toma is also at the North Pacific um, Data Center, uh, works with Paul, but he's going to tell us about um, his wonderful adventures about um, mapping in the Solomon Islands. So, Paul, hopefully you've got, uh, Toma, sorry, you've got um, uh, um, control of the screen, and if you can present and start telling us your talk. Well, hi everyone, my name is Tom Ketter. I'm currently working at CECOM at the North Pacific uh, Regional Data Center with Paul Johnson. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a different project that, that was completely outside of the CBED 2030 and um, CECOM uh, world. But it kind of connects through the angle of, uh, of Map the Gaps, the JEPCO alumni um, organization and nonprofit. Um, so we partnered uh, with a company called Submerge that is based in Costa Rica and a company called Cooks and Adventures that is based in the UK. And um, Map the Gaps um, has provided a JEPCO alumni, myself, um, to, uh, to, to provide mapping, multi-beam mapping, um, consulting and operating a multi-beam and processing the data for a private expedition on board um, a super yacht that has a submersible, the one in the picture. And that expedition was carried out early 2020, right before COVID uh, in the Solomon Islands, which is uh, within the South and West Pacific uh, Regional uh, Data Centers area. So, I'll talk a little bit about our mapping approach and why it's important in this kind of project, um, our setup and what we use, who the team is. And I'll show what we discovered, what we mapped in terms of shipwrecks. There's a lot of World War II activity in Solomon Islands and some of the geographical features we mapped as well. And some key takeaways uh, to wrap up. Um, so, why map in the first place? In the first place, um, usually those uh, lucrative um, expeditions go to very remote places. There's hardly any information about them, and most of these operators don't know actually where to go and where to dive. And when they have their guest on board that pays many hundreds of thousands of dollars and sometimes millions of dollars, um, they want to take them to a known, not a known, but they don't want to waste a dive on on just you know something not exciting. So virtually, there's virtually no knowledge of the seafloor in in 80% of of the world, as you know. Um, another advantage is to discover new dive sites, um, especially in those um, exotic areas that that are not mapped. Um, we can provide reconnaissance uh, for those dives in terms of of planning and safety. Um, and also when when the sub goes down with um, a nice little tablet and some 3D um, 3D models of the dive site that really helps kind of understanding where you are in terms of navigation and also the experience for the client is, uh, is much better because the visibility is very limited underwater, as you know. Um, in terms of equipment, we had a, a Norbit multi-beam uh, fully integrated with uh, an Atlantix MRU, uh, pole mounted on, on the side of a tender boat, and um, we could map down to about 300 meters um, effectively with that system. Uh, we had an AML sound velocity profiler, just we lowered it um, with a little um, like a downrigger, like a fishing, a little fishing thing. And we also were using a USBL system for the sub and for the ROV that we had that was uh, used to, to do some filming and also as um, a rescue um, backup to attach a hook for, to the sub. 
Uh, this is the team. Um, we were four people, uh, two sub pilots, uh, myself for the multi beam, and um, one ROV operator. And this is the boat that we had for uh, for the sub the setup or the reconnaissance. It was just um, an open an open kind of uh, speedboat like that, and using the 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 um, this removable uh, pole mount, we could have the Norbit uh, sonar head at the bottom of the pole, and and the operating position, it's limited to about uh, eight knots, which is a good survey speed, and the GNSS antennas are kind of extended um, to give position and heading. Uh, we're just using a couple of laptops on board for for the planning and for the acquisition. Uh, with an extra display, it kind of helps uh, figure out where we are. And that's as far as the setup. And I just want to show some quick uh, screenshots of the results that we had. And by the way, this is uh, the shipwreck of the World World Discover. It's been stuck in Rotary Bay, Salt Islands for like 20 years. Um, interesting story. Of course, we didn't need a multi beam to find that one. Um, but what we did find was the air and board. I mean, we didn't find it, but we just mapped it. I, th I don't think any of these were mapped before. Um, at 2,000 tons, more than 100 meters overall length, sunk in April of 43 by a, a Japanese uh, dive bomber. And it's uh, sitting upright on the bottom um, at something like 60 meters. And uh, we were able to take some measurements and confirm the, the actual wreck, the, the identity of it. And um, and the next one that we were mapping was the USS Kanawa, which was actually an oiler. And it, it's one of the only ships that served in both world wars. Uh, so that one was pretty cool. Um, and that one was at 55 meters. And uh, we were able to get some cool uh, 3D images of it. And you can see on the bottom left, um, what, uh, just an example to see how you can have that image with you and kind of ro rotate and scale in real time and understand where you are uh, in respect to the, the wreck itself. Because uh, like I said, the visibility is really limited and you can hardly see um, the other side of the shipwreck and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, just another images of another image of the Kanawa. Um, another wreck that uh, we found was in Wickham Harbor. Um, that one is unidentified, unknown um, what it's called or where it came from. It's at 40 meters. Uh, we were able to create some nice images with the, that little um, rise behind it, that little rocky reef. Um, and also you can this is a good comparison between the acoustic image the sounding cloud and um just a visual image from the pretty much same angle you can see this uh this bow um the turret and and this cannon mounted on the bow and of course with the acoustics you're not really limited with with how deep you can see but with the camera of course, you can't see that far. Another cool target that uh, we were able to map was uh, a seaplane, uh, Catalina, also from 1943, but that one wasn't shot down or it wasn't sunk with the weapon. It just uh, flipped over when it was landing. Uh, all the passengers uh, got out safely, so um, no tragedy there, just the plane went down. And this is what it looks like, both with um, camera and these um, images by um, Adam Beard, an underwater photographer that we had. And from the multi beam, after some processing in uh, camera and flutter mouse, uh, we're able to differentiate the wreck from, from the, under, the underlying bathymetry and uh, make some cool, uh, cool looking images. And those were the, the four and more kind of appealing shipwrecks. 
that we saw. And we also mapped a couple other locations. Um, the biggest area that we covered was inside Rotary Bay. Um, and again, this is where the uh, World Discover Rec is based. There's a little community here uh, that we're able to visit. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, a closer look on this data set. Um, Karamulan point, which again, these features were never ever mapped, uh, never seen before. Um, this one's not too exciting, but still better than nothing. And another stretch of coastline here on the uh, Tamak Boho, and I can't pronounce those those names too well, I guess. Gaumi coastline. Um, they're pretty close to Tulagi, which is actually the bigger uh, the bigger island. Uh, so just to, to summarize, there are key takeaways. Um, the data was contributed, was given, part of the agreement between Map the Gaps and those two companies was that all the data that is collected is, is uh, made uh, publicly available. And in this case, we handed it over to the Solomon Islands Maritime Authority uh, for their own use. Uh, they can do with it whatever they want. They have the raw data, they have the process data and the images. Um, it's useful for them for to develop their own kind of local tourism and diving, um, and also to understand better uh, the wrecks and and um, the currents that that control that area. Um, and for for the entire operation, in terms of added value, uh, what we get when we collaborate is uh, easier access to, to special and remote locations and the permitting process is, uh, is facilitated when you offer them um, this kind of data at this kind of resolution and they just get it free of charge. Um, for the diving uh, perspective, we, we know where we're going before the dive. Launching the sub and having the guests inside is, is takes a lot of time and it's very expensive. So you want to do it in the right place. So of course, having a map uh, ahead of time really helps with that. Um, you can actually have new discoveries when you go to new places and map them. Um, we didn't discover a new wreck, but we mapped them for the first time. Um, you greatly increase your mission safety uh, by having uh, a complete picture of, of your dive location and the ability to uh, to work with the ROV and navigate more efficiently in, in case of a rescue. Uh, the dive experience itself is richer when the guests understand where they are and the 3D renderings of the seafloor really, really, I mean, I, ca I can't stress how much that um, helps to, to for people who are not professionals to understand what they're diving into and what the depths are and what is the shape of the seafloor. Um, it's also a very unique uh, way to work with these uh, small subs. There are some bigger operations that do the same method, like you must have heard about the Five Deeps and Ocean X, and 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 those operations are huge, and they are commercial. They're not they're not um, pleasure craft. So this is a very unique thing. Um, I think this was the only company that does that. And of course, the connection to the local community is uh, is huge, especially from from the map the gaps and alumni perspective. Um, in the future, we're probably going to be going to countries where we have alumni from. So that will be a really great opportunity to uh, to collaborate and bring local scientists and and connect that way. And that's about it. Thank you, everyone. Um, happy answering questions if you have. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. That's right. No, I, I've got problems with my laptop, so I'm actually using okay. my cell phone. So All hopefully right. there's no echo or anything. Well, um, yeah. Great talk, Tomo. Thank you very much. Is uh, Has anyone have any questions?
No, it doesn't look like there's anything. Um, just a question for you, Tom. Just out of curiosity, was there a dive yeah. um, tourist operation there anyway? Um, so this was the reconnaissance portion. Um, yeah, and the owner arrived right after that for for his trip with his family. Uh, it, 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 there's no, there's not like a commercial operation there that runs. Um, you know, you can't just book it. You have to bring your own ship and stuff. Right. right. Uh, that makes sense. It's just, I, I had a similar sort of mapping expedition in, in Raul Harbour and Papua New Guinea, but all the World War II wrecks there, but they were actively nice. targeting the wrecks for their divers. So um, I was just yeah. curious about whether or not, the, 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 you know, they can actually use this. I mean, you've already implicated that they can use these data to target these things for their, uh, t for their clients. Um, are yeah. there any other questions from anyone else? Um, if not, uh, we've got scheduled for a break. Um, I was just a question from Stuart. Sorry, um, hi, can you take over? Because I've my teams has crashed totally and I've got no control over everything. So, okay. so hi, can you please take over? Yes, I hope everyone hear me. So Stewart Kai want to ask, he's interested to know what tide corrections were applied or was it surveyed on the ellipsoid? Oh, uh, this was surveyed to spontaneous water level. And since the survey times were pretty short, the areas that we covered were fairly small. There wasn't significant um, tidal range going on. OK. So Steward, it's are you just happy spontaneous with that? water level. Yeah. OK. So nothing else. Yeah. OK, good. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, is but there any not, other question? Not ellipsoid. Ellipsoid is, uh, is not applicable for subdiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. I had to restart my laptop. Um, yep. So we've got a break. Quick, please come back. Everybody come back at quarter to the hour. So that's uh, for my time about um, five or six minutes from now. So it's quarter to the hour, please. Thank you. Right, everybody, um, welcome back. I hope you've all had a chance to stretch your legs um, and get a beverage. I've got my nice yeah. cup of coffee here. Thank you very much. So um, thanks again, everybody who's given their presentations today uh, or, or, the, or during this week. Uh, can I ask actually all presenters, um, if you've given a presentation for this meeting, if you could, if you don't mind, give us a PDF copy of your presentations. Can you send it through to us so that we can um, share it? Um, and if you're okay with sharing the data. Um, what I'd like to go on to now is just go over some um, key points that I think we highlighted um, during the weeks with the presentations. I'm going to share my screen. Um, the first key point, of course, with the take home message is progress to date, the GFCO 2021 grid that's just been released. Uh, the magic number we've got is 20.6% of the world has a direct sounding and is in the GFCO grid. Um, we have, I've got a link there that you can go to uh, to actually download the GFCO 2021 grid. Uh, we'll put that into the chat. Um, the, but of course, what that means is, of course, 80% of the world is currently unmapped, um, and and we're asking you as a community to help us map that 80% to achieve our goal of 100% by the year 2030. Um, also, like to reiterate something that the director said on day one um, that there is a community survey um, out and about. This survey will be uh, it's been going since January this year. It will close at the end of July. If you haven't already completed that survey, uh, can you please um, uh, complete that survey? Uh, and I'll put that link um, into the chat as well for people to uh, uh, complete. Um, one of the key things and the key issues that we have, well, certainly within our centre, is we don't know what we don't know. So quite often we we uh, get asked to uh, look at you know where are the map, where are the gaps where are the maps uh, gaps that uh, we we go mapping only to find out that 
somebody already has done a survey there in the past. Um, and, and what we don't want to do is we don't want to duplicate effort. So if you do know of any data sets that are, that are not in the GEPCO grid, um, please, if you can let us know or, or put us in contact with somebody who might know about it. And if you're not sure what's in the GEPCO grid or not, uh, please go to Paul Johnson's um, portal, that web page, where we had some really good examples of that globe that quite clearly show where there is data and where there is not. So again, um, we need to know where there are data exists that we currently don't have. So if you know of any, please let us know. Um, a further note, please, if you can, in the community, advocate for the CB2030 project for any future work that you might be involved with. So if there are any surveys that are in your part of the world, um, if you can just please just please say to the client, uh, are you um, willing or can you share the data outputs uh, for the survey with CB2030? That would be greatly appreciated. And, and if you need help to um, advocate for it or uh, have any, uh, any issues, feel free to just email us at the data center uh, Pacific at cb2030.org and, and we can help you with that. Uh, another point that was noted as um, as Christy from the DCDB pointed out, we need you to encourage your local hydrographic officers to accept CSB activities in your part of the world. It's all very well the public going out and collecting data and contributing data through um, the crowdsource bathymetry but if the data happens to be in waters where the local hydrographic authority has not accepted those activities, we can't access the data. So um, right now, uh, there is a the, uh, on the DCDB website, you can actually download and see, sorry, the IHO website, you can see uh, which countries have accepted it. And I don't know if Christy's on, if she can put into the chat uh, the URL that shows which countries have, said, have opted in for this. But if your country is not listed, we do appreciate if you can contact your hydrographers and please advocate that they uh, opt in for CSB activities in your waters. Um, this is just a simple thing too. Uh, boats have multi-beam systems. More often than not, they're not turned on. If possible, please, if you can record transit data uh, and, and share that data with us, that would be great. Uh, Frugro do this and they've done it since the beginning of the project. It's fantastic. We've advocated within our neck of the woods uh, for the local fleet to always record their transit data. And it does make a huge difference to the uh, success of the project if this data can be recorded and shared. Um, a further note, please let us know if you can help or, or if we can help uh, you with bathymetric projects. Again, this is about, um, is there anything we can do to help uh, with any work that's doing in your part of the world? Um, if you want help uh, maybe with securing some extra funding to secure something, we might be able to do something. But even if you just communicate with us about some work that's happening in your part of the world, that would be greatly appreciated because we can uh, maybe help with resources or training or, or uh, getting multi beam operators on board boats if that's necessary. We just need to know. Uh, and the next item there is following the meeting, uh, we will send out a questionnaire um, to all the people who have uh, uh, participated in this meeting and we've got some simple questions that um, you can answer. Uh, so please, we do encourage you to fill this in and let us know. Uh, and lastly, I've just got on there um, just an email address for contact. So that's just some notes I've had. Um, hopefully this might stimulate some discussion with people if you have any issues or concerns or comments. Or if you have any um, questions, maybe further questions for um, any, any presenters here that you have. This is just an open discussion. Uh, please feel free to talk. We encourage you to talk about anything you like. So are there any questions out there? Oh, question, we do have a hand raised. Vaughan, Vaughan, please. Hi, I was just um, 
harking back to yesterday and thinking about, or was it the day before, and thinking about the presentation of Julian Colo when he said there was data collected on various um, research vessels for various cruises that actually hadn't been submitted because they were collecting it for other reasons, for bi biology or something, and there was quite a lot of data there. And that could be a source of new data for us that we haven't really thought about and sort of located. Yes, yeah, and, and it is, um, that is, you did raise a very valid point, but the question is how do we, what do we need to do to find out about them, right? That's that's what the million dollar question is. Well, yeah, well yes, <laughs> we could ask the research institutes to actually go back and review their, their sort of what's on the on the ships because often it's left on the ship and never filed. Right, so that's that's the end of the question for everyone who's listening. Um, if they can, and if it's possible, would actually go back and 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 review what has been collected on the particular vessels that they have and find out. Uh, and it'd be useful for your own for your own countries too, right? It's not just for C between thirty. There are quite a lot of data sets I suspect that are sitting on vessel servers or even other servers lying around that that are underutilized um, that would be useful too. And that actually raises a a question that was talked about uh, from Lindsay's conversation about um, lack of MSR approvals. Uh, a question for everyone who's listening, is the ability or inability to get MSR approval, is that an issue that we can possibly help with? I think the issue with MSR approvals is really timing. It's a case of being, um, being if we can accelerate the timing through the sort of the, the mechanisms and cogs of various governments, that would that would actually help things. But often, you know, these things things can take months, and so if you're suddenly only got a few weeks' notice, it just doesn't happen. That's right but i do think maybe if, if there are if there is um msa applications that are going through especially in the pacific islands specifically whether or not it is possible to let us know about it because we might be able to advocate through our own intergovernmental communication channels um to get these approvals done in a more timely manner perhaps i'm just suggesting it that it'd be quite nice that if we can somehow either get into the loop it could help Mm. Yeah. Um, something else that was raised too, that I think um, it was it was alluded to briefly, was the importance of satellite-derived bathymetry for, especially for the Pacific Islands, where there are a lot of um, outlying um, uh, communities that may be uninhabited, but but are very, not communities, but outlying atolls and 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 reefs that are, that are um, a long way away from land probably not high on the importance of being done, or even ones that are of importance. Just, just to let everybody know that in the past, we mm -hmm. have successfully managed to find additional supporting funds for satellite-derived uh, bathymetry products to be done in the Pacific Islands. So uh, if you do have, um, uh, if in your nations, if there are areas that you perhaps think have not been mapped and would like to get mapped, uh, using select what drive bathymetry, there is a possibility that we can actually um, you find, identify funding or identifying resources to make that happen. So if you can let us know uh, at, at Pacific at cb2030.org, um, we can help you. It's been done in the past. Um, Stuart Kai has shown some good examples in the Pacific and the Cook Islands where Jebco has found um, leveraged additional resources to get products out that probably wouldn't have happened before. So I'm just throwing it out there to the community that this is a, this is a um, an activity that that can be done that can help you. Uh, anyone have any thoughts about that?
no, no thoughts. Uh, the second issue, uh, another issue I'd like to raise too, is about the decimation of data too. Now, I, we have at a centre have had talks with various organisations that have rich data sets um, that they are unable to share because of either commercial interests or security interests or strategic interests. And again, I just want to reiterate that the CB2030 product is at the highest resolution 100 by 100 meter product. Uh, we don't need necessarily need to have that super rich high resolution product that that the client may find as being um, important to them. So if it is possible to decimate that to at, at, at the very best 100 by 100 meter resolution, if that helps, we all encourage we do encourage um, people in the community to think about that as a way of getting around um, any security or strategic issues they might have of sharing data. Um, and again, if you have any concerns or, or and this is what we want to know about data sets that are out there that, that are currently not shared, if you can just get hold of us and then perhaps we can have these talks um, with, the, with, the, with the owners, the data owners, and see if we can come up with some mechanism to which they uh, feel comfortable with sharing data with us. Okay, uh, and actually, and that's actually highest just raised. We've got an issue with, in the chat here. Something that, that we, we actually mentioned on day one, um, but wasn't really mentioned since, was the CB2030 project has been accepted um, as one of the original uh, programs of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And I know that a lot of nations, especially in the Pacific Islands, uh, they actually have to report to the UN General Assembly about activities within um, the UN framework that by sharing data is actually a very easy thing to do that will tick the boxes um, that you have to do when reporting back to the United Nations General Assembly. It, it is a, a huge deal um, to say that you're actually actively contributing within the UN decade and, um, and, and we so we encourage you to, as, as owners of the data or nations of holding data, to shamelessly say that you are contributing to the UN decade just by simply sharing data. I think that's that's a big thing to do. And, and one of the critical things about the UN decade, if you look at the goals and aims of that, is actually trying to have a, a complete understanding of the ocean uh, and, and the importance that the ocean has in terms of the environment that we live in, in terms of the climate um, and issues of sea level change. If we don't understand the seafloor in its entirety, then how can we actually plan and predict what's going to happen in the future? So again, please think about the UN Ocean Decade um, and to think about the importance of that and, and about the ability to share data with us to uh, help with the goals of, of the decade. Yeah, there's some great comments coming through from, um, from uh, Lindsay and, and Peter. Uh, we thanks very much for that. I think that's fantastic. And again, if you have any issues or, or concerns, just just talk to us. We're happy to have a video chat with you, uh, and we can talk about um, data sharing. And 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 also realise that um, at the centre, the data can be a two-way flow. While we don't actually give out data, we're not a data portal that we can download from. There are some data sets that we do receive that um, we do have permission to share with other people. So that, for instance, if you have a, 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 if you're in a nation, if you want to know what data we hold in your part of the world, um, please talk to us, and we can actually look at uh, maybe some sort of data exchange that could help you as well. Um, a lot of the data we get is specifically for Jibco, but some of it can be shared with 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 um, nation states if they're interested in. So again, please just talk, contact us, um, and we can have those uh, conversations. So failing any other discussions or points anyone wants to raise? Oh, actually, uh, maybe a question for Vicky, if Vicky's online, I hope she is. In terms of her data centre, um, I'm wondering if she can give us uh, any examples of some um, good engagement that, that she's had in terms of the, um, the Caribbean Sea, in terms of workshops or, or seminars. Is Vicky on? Uh, sorry, Kevin. I think Vicky has already signed out. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And like if anyone else having any comments, I think I'll close this meeting. Uh, oh, no, there's a hand raised from Christy. Christy, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for um, giving me the opportunity to present and just to do another shout out. If anyone has data they'd like to contribute to the DCDB, please do contact me. I'm going to put my email address in the chat again, just so everyone has access. But uh, I'm more than welcome to, to, to talk to anybody who has um, data to contribute or knows anybody. I'm, I'm happy to reach out to any new potential data providers. Yeah, thanks, Chrissy. Just uh, just a question. Does a DCDB take gridded products or does it have to be the raw data files? So um, currently, uh, I, I mentioned it briefly in the in the presentation. Um, we are dealing with a very antiquated pipeline in just pipeline for our, our data. Um, and we're in the middle of revamping that and redesigning it from the ground up. So our current pipeline um, is can take gridded products if it also accompanies uh, processed or raw data. And the reason for that is we are able to generate geometries only from the raw or the processed data. But on our future pipeline with a new updated schema to go along with it in our database, we are going to be able to generate geometries from the grids themselves. So in the near future, we will be able to take only grids as well as processed and raw data. Awesome, thank you. Just want a clarification for that. I see Robin has got his hand up. You have a question for us? Robin from Namaria. Oh, hand down. All right, if there are no more hands up and no more questions, I will officially like to close this meeting and I thank everybody for your participation. Um, we will send out uh, a questionnaire, a follow up questionnaire um, that will help us plan our future engagements for the next year. And also the uh, keep an eye on the center website on the CB2030 webpage. We'll put up the videos uh, and the presentations too for those who uh, uh, are wanting to share their presentations. So again, thank you very much for listening. Um, have a good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, and stay safe. Thank you very much and goodbye.